Hello everybody, it's Alex at the Remote Work Life Podcast or from the Remote Work Life Podcast. You're very welcome, thank you for joining me today and yet another special guest with me today. I've got Laurel Farrer with me today and I've been following Laurel for a little while now. Um, She's one of the very first people that I started to follow when I was considering remote work myself some 10 years ago and I just really feel privileged to have the opportunity to to have Laurel on the podcast today because when it comes to knowledge and insight on remote work there are people who who are experts and then there are thought leaders and, and Laurel is is really up there in terms of her thought leadership she she's a, a distributed operations consultant and she collaborates with some of the the world's top remote friendly companies to strengthen you know, virtual operations, digital um, processes, develop long-distance management strategies. She, she, she writes for some of the top uh, magazines in the world or top online publications um, about remote work, Forbes being one of those uh, publications. So you can imagine that uh, Laurel really knows her stuff. And in terms of the, her clients, I mean, a client is a list of the who's who in the world of of companies, let alone remote companies, New York Times, Logitech, Upwork, Fast Company, Microsoft, Gallup, you know all of those names. So Laurel, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. My pleasure. My goodness, I'm going to blush with an introduction (laughs) like that. I appreciate it. Well, you know, I've got to tell it as it is. And we only have the very, very best on the Remote Work Life podcast. And you certainly uh, or one of those. So thanks so much for taking the time to join me. Because I know you're so busy. You're appearing on podcasts um, here, there, and everywhere. So how is that all going? You, I'm sure you, you, you're pretty busy at the moment. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a, a memorable month and a half, that's for sure. Um, but it, it's starting to slow down or at least stabilize now that the shock factor it has uh, past us. And so now it's just a, a matter of switching the conversation from shock to sustainability. How do we implement remote work on a long-term scale? And, and that's a, a a better and more comfortable topic to be discussing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hang around because that is essentially what we're going to be discussing today because as Laurel said um, the shock factor I hope for you has, has worn off as a, as a manager of a remote team whether that because that's because you've you've been forced into uh, remote work or because you're all of a sudden having to uh, really just sort of I suppose um, amp things up a bit or at least get things um, streamlined and steady so we're, we're going to be speaking really to you managers of remote teams today to to really help you to I guess take things to the next level now that you've started to get your feet uh, under the table in terms of remote work and you're trying to make it work for you for your team so yeah please do stick, stick around so uh, Laurel um, I, I'm really intrigued I mean I've, I've looked I've done lots of research on you but I'm really intrigued from your own standpoint to know how you got to this point. I mean, you, you, you've you been in remote work for a number of years, you've been doing remote work and advising on remote work for a number of years. But from what I can see, you were in events at one point. How did that all sort of transition into where you are now? Yes, I'm the black sheep of the remote work world that I do not come from tech. <laughs> Um, and that's actually part of my my origin story, I guess, if you will, um, because I was in in services. Um, I was in the events industry for the first decade of, of my career, and so I I was running fully distributed teams uh, in that industry. And didn't get connected with the terminology and the community of remote work until just a few years ago. And when I did get connected with them, it was just this this huge epiphany and revelation and and relief because they had so much uh, structure and terminology around things that I had been doing for so long. And so it was this great um, moment of knowledge sharing um, because I said, oh, I'm so excited to learn from all of you guys, these, you know, other distributed companies and and virtual uh, leaders. I said, oh, I'm so excited. I've only been doing this for 10 years. And they said, 10 years? <laughs> we were in middle school. <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah, I know you were. <laughs> um, so that's when they we had this back and forth, right? That I said, um, 
you know, this is a best practice that I found in the different companies that I've worked with. And they said, oh, yeah, we have a word for that. It's it's a stand up. Right. Or, oh, we have a word for that. Like it's distributed or, you know, things like that. And I was like, oh, well, you guys really have a lot of information to share. Um, it, it could do with a bit more polishing based on on longevity. But you really should get this out of the tech world. Um, you really need to share this with other industries and, and larger companies. And so that's what, what put me into the position that I'm in. It's I'm like, yeah, let's t- let's talk to healthcare and see what they're doing. Let's talk to engineering and see what they're doing. And so it wasn't necessarily that I was the best or the brightest expert that put me into a thought leader position position, it was that I was willing to expand out of the silos that previously existed. And I think, yeah, those silos, I suppose that's um, characteristics of of the, of many of the the people within the remote world, not just, just yourself, but it's, it's about, I think lots of people think about remote work and remote workers as being quite closed off and quite uh, Mm -hmm. retreating into uh, their bedroom or wherever it may, it may be but it, it requires so much more it requires a lot of um, communication it requires a lot of getting out there and seeing what people are doing in, in a deliberate way doesn't it um, and it looks like that's yeah. what you've really been doing I love that I've never thought about that as a, a symbolic macro representation of what we um really epitomized as remote workers. But yes, you're absolutely right that you need to be much more transparent, much more proactive and much more consistent and open in your communication style. That doesn't necessarily mean that you need to be, you know, extroverted or aggressive or any of those negative words, but just more open. And um, so, yeah, I've, I've never thought of myself as a, as an exemplification of that, but I guess I am. That's, that's a fun thing to think about. Definitely, definitely. Not to mention you're appearing on another two podcasts today, I think. So that does require in itself a lot of uh, a lot of networking, a lot of speaking. So yeah, um, just keep doing what you're doing. I love it. I really do love what you're doing. Um, Thank you. In terms of okay, so for you then, I mean, you're at Distributed. You 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 run. You're CEO of Distributed um, at the moment. Um, but where does so you're I suppose happily appears as your main 100% distributed role. Could you take me forward from there then in terms of uh, how you sort of evolved into then becoming uh, the consultant that you are today as well? Yeah, I believe it was the largest distributed team that I I managed, but uh, how I actually got started in remote work was almost a decade before that. It was um, when I took my own team remote as, again, I was operations management. That's uh, been my career until I, I found it. Uh, distribute consulting and uh, back in the very beginning it was me and the CEO of a of a small events firm in Colorado and we were in a critical stage of growth that we were looking to save costs on real estate we were just at that stage that we needed to get you know the big downtown office and uh, to impress all of the clients and and so we were getting ready to make that jump but the irony of the events industry is that you get an office but during the busy season you're never you're never in it because you're always on site at the event and so we were getting um ready for that busy season we're scaling up hiring people and we said you know what if we just pushed pause just for a few months just to save on that those real estate costs and at the end of the season we'll we'll get the office space and um and so that's what we did and we never got the office we were just so impressed with the employee retention and the recruiting benefits with the saved costs i mean we were a small business and that really made or break made or broke our our bottom line and um we, we were just thrilled with the results that we saw. And, but at the time, I mean, this was what, 2006. So this was, not, it was not cool then. It was not, um, you know, trendy to be a distributed company. You could not tell anybody that you were, that you didn't have an office space. There's no way that we would have been taken seriously as a woman owned small business without an office, like no way. Um, and so that's when we had to play it off as good customer service, like, like, oh, we'll meet you at the event site or we'll come to you or let's meet for coffee oh, yeah. or something like that. So we had to cover it up. But it was 
just made so much sense as a business strategy. And so through the years, I, I consulted on the side um, as technology continued to develop. I would just answer questions for people in my network about how to operate this way to save on real estate costs. And so it was, it was fantastic. We, we, you know, we watched the evolution of video conferencing becoming accessible and um, cloud collaboration with, with like Google suite and stuff. And it was a really great process to be a part of and, and to grow and build. And, and so that's what, gave me that that consulting experience so um yeah after i worked with those larger companies and realized that there was a right way and a wrong way to do remote work and that there really was some uh, a, a need for consulting in that space then that's when i just took my you know on the side consulting hobby and turned it into distribute consulting and so now we we advise on all things remote work sometimes it's change management consulting sometimes it's just subject matter expertise and we advise on products or market research um we host events we write content like all things remote work we really help people understand it and leverage it on it um, in a in the best way possible and would you say i mean you mentioned that uh, almost like a credibility issue that you had with trying to convince people that you were I don't know what the word is but I I mean I had that myself it not not in the same way that you did it but did but um when I was consulting in terms of my career consulting I chose to um I chose to be fully remote as well but everybody always used to ask me um can we can I meet you at the office or where's where's your office sort of thing and that for Mm -hmm. me was a big challenge a big big hurdle for me to overcome what was that probably your biggest hurdle in terms of that factor that you mentioned? Oh, yeah. I'm, I mean, we still see this now, right? Yeah. I mean, this is why remote work is such a big topic right now during the coronavirus um, contingency plans is because people think, oh, is this sustainable? Like, w- would we lose any credibility? Would I lose any credibility if I weren't in the office connecting with my boss every day? Like, this is still a, a a a big concern for everybody and justifiably so i mean this is a big transition and it's part of an entirely new industrial revolution Mm -hmm. and so people are there's a lot of uncertainty and and um it's a big risk to take in your career so that's exactly why we exist as consultants is to make sure that people understand that this is a sustainable strategy and how they can uh, position themselves as a business or as a worker or as a manager to be more visible and more confident in their career development and just making sure that people understand that this is um, this is really a, a, um, a benefit and a reward on so many levels. And I think that's exactly what makes Distribute Consulting unique is that there are so many people out there that evangelize remote work, that they are just, they say, oh, this is so great. Everybody should do this. Um, anybody that's not doing this is ridiculous. And, and that's, ridiculous and that's completely unrealistic yeah. and so um we we do we pride ourselves in being that credible um realistic thought leader that says we understand that this is complicated and we're going to walk you through this process we we understand that there's um you know unsexy issues to talk about like compliance and payroll and international tourism laws mm-hmm. like we understand that and so we 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 talk about the more serious side of remote work and again it, the um you're also founder of the remote work association does that association always sorry not always but also um sort of under underline that that point in terms of getting our credibility out that getting our you know having a credible voice for people within remote work. Is that what that's all about? Absolutely. This is uh, all about building community. And when I started the Remote Work Association, it was never intended to be a, a large community like it is now. It was just meant to be a place where remote work advocates could really connect about the topic of remote work at a higher level. Because again, that's what I had been missing because I was siloed in a different industry than tech. And so I didn't even know the term remote work until I was a remote work thought leader. Um, the first time I heard the word ad- 
agile was when I spoke at an international agile conference, you know, like it just so much was siloed. And so I wanted to help that and say, let's all unify, not just from the tech industry, but from all of these different industries, different countries, um, different levels of roles, like whoever you are, if you're a freelancer or a C-level executive, if you're a remote work advocate and you want to talk about this at a deeper, meaty level, let's let's meet here in the Remote Work Association. And it just started as a very um, small, informal invitation that I sent to about 30 friends that I had spoken at conferences with. And, and then now it's several hundred members strong with members all over the world and, and companies um, that are some of the most reputable and, and impressive brands in the world. So it's, it's an honor to be a, a member of that community, let alone the founder of it. Tell us the URL for that. I, I want to share that out as well. I'll put it in the show notes too, obviously, because I think that's really important. Because, I mean, it, it feels like remote work is, is a movement, but it really, I mean, it shouldn't necessarily, I don't think necessarily should be a movement um, in a sense, but it's good that there is some sort of movement, if you see what I mean. So mm-hmm. where, what's the URL? Where can we find that? Yeah, that's the re- remote work association. Dot com mm-hmm. and uh, it's where thought leaders connect and can really ask each other questions and share their expertise with newcomers and so we have a great campaign that's uh, really taken hold during the uh, coronavirus contingency plan wave of keep the world working and so it's all about economic impact and business continuity during this time of transition and it's where a lot of our members are offering free consultations to new leaders that uh, have a lot of questions about remote work but maybe don't necessarily need or can't afford full level consulting right. that's what they're providing through that association and yeah it's it's people that are actually uh, credible experts as opposed to, um, let's say, marketing capitalists uh, <laughs> that are taking advantage of of good SEO and, and a strong news cycle. Uh, that's something that we really saw a lot of during the uh, during March 2020, right? A lot of businesses, a lot of companies that said, oh, we're work from home experts. Mm -hmm. And we said, oh, okay, you have experience with this. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Uh, Because I remember two months ago asking you if you worked remotely and you said no. Um, So yeah, it was a a tricky time to navigate, but, um, and it still is. So we want to make sure that people have access to true authorities and not just enthusiasts and, and not just, um, experienced workers, but true, comprehensive, diverse uh, thought leaders and experts that can help them through th- through this transition. Make sure, guys, you check out the show notes. The link to the association will be in there and have a look. And yeah, it, it was really disappointing in some ways to see, you, you call them, um, what did you call them? Marketing? You were very polite in what you said, you called them. <laughs> <laughs> Marketing capitalists. I like I think. that. I like that. Yeah, it was opportunistic people who are just yes. jumping on the bandwagon of, oh, we can do this for your your tech. We could do this for your team. We're remote this, remote that. It was yeah, yeah. I know exactly what you mean. But yeah, to- it's been uh, it's been tricky. I don't, I mean, I'm I'm happy for the support of remote work. You know, as advocates, this has been something that we've been working for for a long time so I'm happy to see that people are are supporting and understanding remote work um, on a larger scale however uh, <laughs> I, as you mentioned I'm a Forbes writer and so there's a lot of uh, press releases that come through my inbox and uh, from people that are hoping that I'll cover it through Forbes and I, I mm-hmm. I've started sharing them with my team at distribute just so we can get a laugh together um, because some of the 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 capitalism that we've seen the opportunistic marketing that we've seen is just absolutely hilarious i've seen um like a smoothie shop that um was trying to capitalize on this that i've seen um like stuffed animals i've seen oh, wow. um just like false eyelashes really? <laughs> like, like How yeah like i know i'm like wow, okay, that's um, my market and my competition has changed a little bit in the past month. (laughs) Just a bit. And it just, I mean, that's in a way why I started uh, Remote Work Life was just to really, well, actually not this wave of sort of opportunists, but even before this whole wave, this, this whole thing is now, I suppose, intensified because of what we're going through. But 
just wanted to to be able to have some place where people can come and really see people like yourself mm-hmm. who who know what they're talking about and they can be sure that they're talk, you know they're listening to somebody who's an expert because it's it's it becomes information overload doesn't it if everybody's saying yeah oh I can do this for you I can do that for you I've done this in terms of the remote world so yeah it doesn't yeah. make it easy and it can be very dangerous as well Absolutely. if you're listening to people that have no idea what they're talking about um you can put your your company in a lot of danger that's the pro- that's the problem with change management of towards remote work in general is that typically it's a very careful meticulous well planned strategic process that takes at least three to six weeks minimum if not three to six months um and now we saw the entire world do this overnight and then they think oh well now i'm a distributed company click like you know i'm done check it was that was easy and that's not the case at all it is not just a matter of sending your workforce home with a laptop. And if the, all the only perspectives that they see um, is this noise of these opportunistic marketers that are saying, yeah, like it, it is that simple. And yes, this is so great. And if you're not doing this, you're stupid. And, and, you know, here are, here's a comic book that I wrote about remote work, you know, like all of these ridiculous, ridiculous um, messaging Yes, it's beneficial for their business, but it makes it harder for leaders to get access to the resources that they actually need to make this sustainably and successfully. And so, yes, I I mean, I highly recommend that all of these leaders understand that allowing remote work but um, is very, very different than actually adopting remote work. And in order to do it successfully, you need to adopt, you need to make changes to your learning and development teams, your onboarding systems, your talent acquisition funnels, your policies, your infrastructure and communication channels, your org chart, like everything needs to be evaluated on a very serious level. And so make sure that you screen your consultants and your subject matter experts very, very carefully. Yep, and there's going to be a lot of them popping up in your inbox or on your your LinkedIn feed. So yeah, you do have mm-hmm. to really scrutinise them. In a way, it's it's, it's kind of um, on the other side of things. Um, it's like you said, it's it's quite dangerous because I get a lot of people, for example, on the side of of job seekers who are trying to, uh, you know, get into remote work, and they're they're faced with like a plethora of of people um, sort of claiming to, to offer that sort of facility because they're using it as a means of marketing their business as opposed to, mm-hmm. you know, what the business is about. They're saying, oh, we, they're using that as, the, as their main banner to get people involved. And that, that in itself as well is also, it's, it's, quite, it's pretty dangerous too because people get mm-hmm. burned in, from those sorts of experiences. So, yeah. Um, yeah, if you adopt it correctly, you can make a lot of money from, um, or I should say, save a lot of money from adopting a remote work model. I mean, the average is about 11 to $20,000 uh, US dollars um, per worker per year, uh, if you adopt it correctly. However, if you don't, it can cost you that much, if not more. So yeah, it's, I mean, you, you really put your, your, <laughs> you're taking a risk if you are consulting the wrong authority. Absolutely. And on that, I mean, let's um, let's talk a bit about them because they, we're here to sort of really help um, managers of remote, remote teams um, and some of whom have been put in a situation where their, their hand has been forced into the scenario that they're in. Others where I guess remote work is something that they're, they're, they've been doing for a little while and but there's still areas that they need to improve um, within their team as well. I mean, what steps, uh, Laurel, can can managers take to really help their team to become better remote workers? Mm. Well, obviously, long term, I would suggest working with a consultant to really review and optimize your remote work model. Um, but in the short term, that's uh, we all just need a band aid right now, right? So as a as a benchmark for an emergency contingency plan, I recommend that every single leader do a minimum of three things. The first thing is to streamline your communication channels. Um, the first week and or two of uh, just coronavirus media 
boom, everybody was talking about tools. What tools do I need? What software do I need? You know, like that was the only conversation happening. And it's really, really critical to remember that as managers, we can use tools to do our job better and to be more efficient with our results, but we cannot depend on the tool to do the job for us. So it's still important to um, unify your team, to motivate your team, to inspire results and innovation. You know, all of those, um, all of those factors, you cannot have a tool do for you. And so don't get tempted to add so many tools to your software stack that it becomes cluttered and disorganized and people are in 18 different places all at the same time. Really streamline your software stack as much as possible and just build a toolkit of maybe one or two or three um, tools and keep your people in those three places maximum. That way you're essentially, exactly. You're just in, that gives you the sense of, being in the same place at the same time and people have much, much more accessibility to information and to each other. And that by itself helps prevent isolation. Um, So that's the first one is to simplify your communication channels. The second one is to upskill. So get some specific training for your workforce that is about remote work specifically. Uh, The caveat and the cruel irony of remote work is that you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, So you go home and you're sitting here with your laptop and you think, well, I think we're doing okay. I I mean, it seems like we're doing okay. Are we doing okay? I don't know. Um, And you just have no benchmark. You have no way of measuring. And so it's, that's another reason why it's uh, critical to get connected with a, a consultant or an expert that, is from your industry that can say, this is where you need to be as a benchmark and let me give you that training to fill the gap between where you are now and where you need to be. And so that's workforce training um, on skills like self-management, that's leadership training on how to manage and supervise productivity without uh, sensory supervision. Like there, there's all of these components that you need to be thinking about. Um, so second is, is training. And then third is policy. So as a consultant, the number one reason that people have policy retractions or concerns with their remote work models is misaligned expectations. Everybody has a slightly different interpretation of what remote work is going to look like in their life. And often those don't match up with a manager's perspective and a worker's perspective. And so there's problems like, oh, I can't get a hold of them when I need to, or you said you were gonna deliver that, um, but I needed it last week. And like, there's all of these just small frustrations that add up and accumulate to big problems and big frustration. And so developing a remote work policy and just having a discussion as a team about what is going to be expected of us to make this work is, absolutely essential, not only as a legal document, but as a a team agreement as well. And I, on the Distribute Consulting website, we have a free policy download for everybody because we do feel like this is so essential for everybody to, to know about and to have. Yeah. And I think we should link to that as well in the show notes, because um, you, you take me back to a time when I, I was in a team that allowed um it allowed me to work remotely but not everybody on the team was really on board with remote working and Mm -hmm. it caused all kinds of um, confusion and conflict and frustration and there was no there's no policy around remote work for everybody just to sort of uh, gravitate towards and understand that this is how we you know how we've implemented remote work within our team so I think that's really important so I'm going to ask for the link to that so we can put that in the show notes um a bit yeah later definitely on. okay yeah distribute consulting.com and and it's just there as a banner on the top of the screen oh it's at the top of the screen as well okay good yep. great um okay so um that was a great steps there thank you laurel um so i mean in this scenario in the scenario that we're in it's very unusual um as i as i mentioned before lots of people managers t- you know teams have been forced to go the way of remote work unfortunately for them um and they may have a mix of skill levels um because i mean one of the things that you 
associate with with remote workers over the years is that they have a pretty good handle on on technology and how to use cloud systems, email, you know, you you name it. But if if your team has a mix of skill levels or, or kind of job functions um, mm-hmm. that probably aren't that acclimatized mm-hmm. to um, working with the technology, how do you keep them on board and avoid that sort of isolation? Mm-hmm. Yeah, isolation and discrimination too, right? Yeah. We see this a lot with um, the team members that are on site and they have the accessibility to each other that they need. They have more visibility for job promotions and then the, the remote workers are kind of out of sight, out of mind. Uh, a quote that I refer to often is from a, a partner of ours over at Workplaceless and they say, if you have a remote team member, you have a remote team. And that rings true for um, every uh, every company that I've ever consulted, but especially right now, as we consider this question, who is going to be able to stay working remotely permanently? Who needs to go back to an office? You know, what does that all look like? And so that's uh, part of what we do at Distribute is that we evaluate each role and we identify how much do they need to be on site? How much can they be off site? Um, how does that impact the org chart? You know, all of all of those questions questions. Um, but the the criteria really boils down to if your job can't, it primarily uses a computer as its equipment, then it's remote friendly. And so we encourage as many people to work remotely as possible, even if they're not necessarily working off site. So what this means is that all of your team members, uh, regardless of if they are in the office or if they're out of the office, they're all meeting in a remote environment. So they're all sitting down and having video calls from their computer equally. And that helps eliminate like those awkward situations of everyone sitting in the, in the conference room. And here's this webcam that's like way yeah. in the corner of the room. And they yeah. have the remote workers have no idea what's going on. They can't hear anybody. They can't see anything. Mm. And that's what's really creating those um, discriminatory factors. So, yeah, we encourage everybody to uh implement the same workflows and and collaborate in the same communication channels whether they're on site or off site yeah i like that nice and simple nice simple sort of uh way of doing things that keep things simple here that's that's good so um what should managers do to help their team because i mean again um even as a as a i suppose a um, a remote worker or somebody who's working in a distributed team, there are challenges. And one of those challenges is, you know, keeping the the whole mindset um, uh, on Mm. top of things where that's concerned. What Mm. should managers do to help their team with the psychological challenges of the the current remote work situation? Yeah, you know, this is really tough because this is not uh, what businesses have have just converted to is not a work remote work model right like this is not remote work i want to be very clear that yeah. even remote work experts like myself are overwhelmed and stressed and chaotic like this is not working remotely this is trying to work remotely amidst a global pandemic mm-hmm. and um an international economic crisis this and and meantime trying to take care of ourselves take care of our family members our loved ones um try combining our entire lives into our homes Mm -hmm. so all within the same several you know hundred square feet we are working from home learning from home shopping from home worshiping from home Home cleaning from home exactly (laughs) like everything in the same space and it's a lot and it's overwhelming and it's completely disrupting both our personal lives and our professional lives so um i think right now uh not i think Two months ago, three months ago, the advice that I was giving to leaders about how to best support their workers is very different than the advice that I give right now. Right now, we just need patience. We need support. We need encouragement. And we need open minds um, because our work and our lives are 
totally blurred. And, you know, typical advice like, yes, you should arrange childcare and have enforced quiet environments and things like that. That's unrealistic. Like that's not going to happen right now. So right now we just need to accept that uh, work and life are the same thing right now. And we need to be okay with that and encourage and allow our workers to be their whole selves. And um, that might be, uh, you know, taking a break to make lunch as mom, or it might be mean taking a break um, in or taking a day off to go attend to a, a sick loved one or something like that, or uh, volunteer work in an emergency crew or something. Um, but our, our, our personal lives are flexible. Our work lives are flexible. So right now we just need a lot more patience and acceptance from everybody um, as a as a temporary solution. And if people, this is this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs and action, right? Mm-hmm. If people feel that safety, they feel the the emotional safety, they feel the financial safety of, um, you know, I'm not going to lose my job if I'm not perfectly online at 12.03 p.m. Um, if they feel that acceptance as a whole person, then they will feel more relaxed and relieved and will be able to focus on productivity and output more than if you were just enforcing and driving results. And it requires a whole different, um, as a manager, it requires a whole different, um, not just a mindset in terms of your managerial skills, but just the, just the way you relate to to, to people because you, you, mm-hmm. can you imagine a manager who was perhaps um really hands-on and looking over the shoulder of their employees to to now be in a scenario where they're having to just completely you know take a not a, not a back seat but kind of just completely change the way that they manage people it must be a challenge it is absolutely so much of our management styles as office leaders are sensory and totally on a subconscious level. We don't realize this, right? Like this is a derivative of historical uh, office environments where they came from. This all came from the industrial revolution where we had physical equipment and physical products and physical workflows and physical supervision. We can see work happening. We can see goods being produced. We can see um, people talking. We can hear phones ringing. Like this is all, this all tells us that the day is being productive. Um, however, our uh, in, for knowledge workers specifically, our products have become virtual, our workflows have become virtual, our equipment has become virtual, and so it now makes sense that we need to update our management and supervision styles to also be virtual. And so, yes, this is a really critical piece of that upskilling and that training that we were talking about earlier is that we need to understand what the difference is. It's not a big difference, but it is a very important and intentional difference on how to measure productivity, how to support and offer feedback, um, how to build relationships and empower productivity and, and efficiency, like all of those things need to be adjusted for a virtual environment. Mm-hmm. And it's a massive, I mean, remote work is a culture shift in itself, but imagine it's, it's almost a culture shift in lightning speed as, you know, you, you used to be in an office in January. Now you're in an office, now you're working from home. So the whole culture of your organization is, is like just yes. changing literally overnight, you know? <laughs> yes. And we see that uh, on the consulting end, too, that previously all of our clients, um, even if they were coming to us hesitantly, they were still coming to us. Right. Like we can see that we need some help with remote work. We're here. We're willing. Our minds are open. And so therefore we're ready to to engage with your consulting services. Um, but now the market is so diverse. It's people that have previously never thought of themselves as remote friendly ever. And now they all of a sudden have to figure it out. Or people that were very, very against remote work for whatever reason. Um, now we have to help them through that mindset shift. Like, And as well as people that said, well, this is great. I always wanted this. And I've always thought that this was a viable option. And now here we are. So it is our market um, has polarized and expanded Mm -hmm. so 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 much and so yeah there's a lot of people that have a lot of questions and 
need assistance on levels that we previously have never seen before. I mean, we're working with companies that um, have never even had a video call. Um, I've been asked wow. for people to um, fax information to them in the past few weeks. Like, really? oh, I don't, <laughs> I don't have that capability. Do you have that capability? <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> Oh, wow. So, yeah, there's a, a lot of companies that are really hurting because they don't understand how to make this transition. And that's why we're here to help. And, yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I'm laughing at that. But, yeah, it's, it's different. I mean, it's a different world, isn't it? The, the remote world is different, but it's, 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 still, it's very open. And it's, it's, we're all about supporting and collaboration and communication and all, all that sort of thing. But I, I guess those kinds of things, it can be quite... It is stressful for managers, the whole situation right now. I mean, but if you're a manager and you're under these kind of stresses, how can you also, um, you know, make sure that your team, the people around you are, are happy as well? How do you do that mm -hmm. without sort of bombarding them with emails or bombarding them with, with you know, video conferencing calls, all that sort of stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so because of that transition from that physical supervising uh, methodology into virtual management, it is the default and very subconscious default for most managers to turn into micromanagers in a virtual environment. Like, I need to know what you're working on. Like, are you working? This is by far the number one concern of all managers is how do I know that my people are working? Um, so there's, uh, again, the training helps with this because I know that this sounds like a big difference uh, just when I say it, but if we can transition our methodologies to be based more on trust than on um, sensory supervision, and then that gives us the permission and the flexibility to start measuring results and output instead of activity. So we're measuring accomplishment instead of activity. And that um, that really is what gives us the that flexibility to take our hands off during the production workflows. So um, a, a very oversimplified and basic example that I give is if I hire a company to wash my car, I don't need to watch them do it to know if they did a good job. At, you know, I don't need to know if they washed it in the garage or in the parking lot or what type of soap they used, or did they do the, the um, back seat before the front seat, or did they do it in the morning or the afternoon? Like, I don't need to know that. I just need to empower them and trust them to do what they do best, to do the job that I hired them to do. And then at five o'clock when I pick it up, when they told me to pick it up, I'll be able to see if they did a good job. And, uh, and maybe there's some things that I can do in the meantime to support them in their job and to clarify my expectations prior to it. It doesn't necessarily mean that I, you know, take my hands completely off, but, but we do need to just be able to facilitate our our workflows in a different way and that does mean more of an indirect relationship as managers that we are now instead of controlling the results ourselves we need to empower our workers and our team members to self-manage the results on their own while we indirectly support the results by supporting the team member so we support them as they control the results instead of us controlling the results. And that is where we see the highest levels of um, retention, productivity, profitability is with that enhanced uh, model of a supportive management role. Mm -hmm. I love that analogy though, with the, with the car, I really like that because obviously when the cars um, finish, you'll be able to see it's nice and clean and shiny, won't you? Without having to be there. I, I love that. I might use that in the future if, if that's okay. With you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll quote you. I'll quote you on that. I'll quote oh, thank you. you. Credit. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> Excellent. I mean, I've got tell you what. Every time we uh, cover an answer, I, I, I get more questions coming into my head. But I know that you're <laughs> you're really busy, and um, I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, um, Laurel. But um, I, I just wanted to, to ask you just another couple of questions before I, I, I let you go. Um, yeah, I mean, we can do it part two another time. Oh, that would be great. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Good, 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 good. What, uh, I suppose, when you're not, when you're not working, what, what kind of things are you, are you doing in a normal scenario? What, what other kind of stuff do you normally do? 
I was just gonna say like right now Not that's right now. Uh, <laughs> a very short answer. <laughs> um, no, this is this is really important because uh, ironically, as a segue from what we just talked about, most managers are so panicked, right, that their remote workers are not going to be working mm -hmm. during the hours that they say that they are going to or that they need to. Um, the irony is that remote workers actually work more than their in-office counterparts. Yes. And so burnout is very, very, very common in remote workers because it is so easy to work a 10, 12, 14 hour day. And um, I'm definitely fall into that category that I do that all the time. Cutting my hours off at the right time is really hard. Even after almost 14 years of working remotely, I still still struggle with this on a daily basis. So this is a, a good question to ask. Um, so with the caveat, the disclaimer that I am not as good at, at this as I would like to be, um, I love uh, spending time with my family. I do have two kids and a husband that also works from home. Uh, we live in a farmhouse in rural Connecticut that we renovate. So that's a a big thing that we do. We have um, chickens that we're raising and we are renovating the home and, and doing a lot of landscaping work. We, we bought it as a fixer upper uh, last year and there's still a lot of work to be done. And so doing something physical like that is really fun for me because you know, so much of my day and so much of my time is all on a screen. It's really satisfying for me to be able to go outside and work mm -hmm. hard with my muscles and my hands and, and you know, get dirty. Um, it's a nice juxtaposition for the work that I do during the day. I love that as well, because you, you raise a, a nice point there as well, because I think it's, it's important to have something else to do um, and, and sort of take yourself away from the computer and have that discipline. I also struggle myself with, with working too much. But I think having sort of like a project where you can get your get your teeth into something else that's going to take mm -hmm. you a month or two months to do is is something that can be a, a welcome distraction from 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 work. So I like that example. Love it. Yeah, and I think that managers can and should encourage that. Um, encourage that transparency of. What have you been working on? How are you preventing burnout? Because the last thing they need are a whole bunch of frazzled and, and depressed mm. employees that have are just working too hard that they're burning themselves out. So, yeah, ask people about it. it again, it allows them to be their whole selves during this time of a lot of blurriness. Um, and it's it's a great culture building activity to build relationships and camaraderie with each other to say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm building a chicken coop mm -hmm. too, or I just finished this great book. I think that everybody would love it. Or here's a picture of me. You know, I went out running today and it was so great. Like it just allows people to uh, have those interpersonal kind of water cooler chats that mm -hmm. we might be missing from the break room. And there was everybody thinking that we just spent time in our bedrooms on our laptops, just just, just working away <laughs> at our keyboards, you know. Yeah, we're you, not, right? maybe not as much of hermit, hermits as we thought we were. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, Laurel, it has been a pleasure. And yeah, I hope we can do that part two, because as I said, I've got loads more questions for you. Um, yeah, you definitely. Like, I'd be happy to. Excellent. It's been great having you on. What's, what's the future look like for, for you and what's the immediate future, I, I suppose? Yeah, the future is um, we're really focused on positioning and encouraging remote work as a business continuity strategy, not only for uh, post-COVID, but especially as our international economy starts to head into a deeper and deeper recession. Mm -hmm. We're very, very focused on that. Businesses can save a lot of money and a lot of jobs by leveraging remote work. And so that's what we're focused on as um, as a consulting firm is helping businesses do that, but then also helping helping uh, national and international governments understand how to support businesses in doing so. So yeah, we've got a lot of work ahead of us, but we are happy to help and honored to be in this position of authority and assistance during such a hard time. And guys. For more information, go across to distributeconsulting.com. Laurel, thank you again, and we'll speak to you again soon, I hope. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me, Alex. I appreciate it. Anytime.